I would like to present uh, about the last uh, big earthquake in Turkey, which was a devastating one uh, last year. This is nearly uh, the uh, this is uh, near the past just a year after this big earthquake. So uh, by that time, we worked mm -hmm. with our association and with the university as well. So that's why I would like to summarize what we did in the earthquake area. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you the Trauma and Disaster Mental Health Studies Association. Uh, it was an interdisciplinary association, including psychiatrists, child psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists, and so on. And uh, the main target of this association is capacity building activities throughout the country and abroad, and also planning and implementing the psychosocial programs and mental health support model in Turkey and abroad as well. Uh, so uh, the history of child is not so far, nearly five or six years, but the baseline is uh, depending on nearly 20 or 25 years. This means the, this means there is a huge experience or Turkish experience behind the target. Just before uh, the pandemic, Tardi is dealing with Elazığ earthquake, which was a local earthquake in the same region. And after the pandemic, we all deal with psychosocial support programs uh, about the effects of the pandemic, like the world, the rest of the world. And uh, on February 6, uh, two major earthquakes occurred in the southeast region of Turkey. The big cities involved in these earthquakes, so it was very devastating. Then we implement a psychosocial support project called Afan. Afan uh, is an Arabic term, but we use this term in uh, Turkey as well. This means uh, this refers to Antakya's past. Afan is one of the places and neighborhoods uh, in Antakya, which is affected by the earthquake as well. Among its many meanings, it also has a meaning such as kept away from the evil. And we establish these projects in six different uh, cities or regions. Maybe you know some of them, Antakya, Skanderun, Antep, Maraş, Adıyaman, Osmaniye, Malatya, Şanlıurfa, and Diyarbakır. This means that the all affected area. And we work with nearly 70 mental health workers, as I said before, in nine different provinces. The target group is, as usual, uh, affected people, immigrants, uh, and also the people who are living outside the earthquake area. The at-risk groups, disabled people, refugees and refugees children as well, workers, healthcare workers, aid workers, and also the professionals who are working in some, uh, in some uh, ministries. And we use generally the uh, methods such as triage, family and group counseling, individual therapy, psychological first aid, psychoeducation, culturally adapted cognitive behavioral therapy for adolescents and for the elderly, especially problem management and more techniques and positive parenting. And we have collaborated many institutions. You see the list of them. We have a huge, we established a huge network in the area. 
and we work in prefabricated areas and we worked in prefabricated offices and our psychosocial support centers are these kind of prefabricated sites. And here are some photographs from our offices and from the work we did some we did the children, earthquake survivors children and earthquake survivors adulthood. And you see some other pictures from different parts of Turkey. Antakya is one of our major uh, working area. Uh, we work nearly six different container camps or container cities in Antakya with nine employees. And also we support these employees with the supervision uh, and the other support programs. This is some uh, pictures from uh, the activities that we have in 8th of March for the Women's Day event. And here are some photographs from the field group works. And we have also some classroom uh, psychosocial activities and we use some tents for these kind of activities in the earthquake region. And we also support the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Social Affairs uh, professions uh, for the self-care and staff care. The other part, the other region is Iskenderun. Here, the regions which we work in Iskenderun, and here are the some psychosocial and social activities that we have in Iskenderun with the staff. And the third region is Antep, uh, one of the famous cities about the cuisinery in Turkey. So we established uh, nearly the same projects in Antep as well. And here you see some photographs, what we did in Antep, some social activities, psychosocial work, some training programs. Marash is an important city for us. It's the epicenter city of the earthquake and uh, our staff is working uh, in Marash there. And also we support these staff with the team leaders and uh, some academicians. They give some supervision to our staff, like in other regions as well. These are the photos from Marash group sessions. Adiyaman, uh, and I think the second most uh, affected region in Turkey about this earthquake. So we have a, a nearly uh, 14 employers there working in Adyaman and they work with the same principles in different container cities. Malatya is another region and we have the staff there. So they are working in different container cities and they deal with some psychosocial support programs and mental health programs as well, like in the other regions. And Urfa. And here are some photographs from Urfa about the group sessions and the training. Osmaniye is a small city, but affected from the earthquake as well. And the Erbakar. Maybe you know the Erbakar, it's an affected uh, city, but not as much as the other cities. So uh, we work also with uh, 11 field managers, additional to project staff there in the Afan. And as I said before, we support our staff with the supervision. And also we have volunteers, additional to our professional staff uh, and the academicians. We have some volunteers, so many volunteers work in the uh, earthquake region, uh, nearly one, one week. And in the region, uh, this is an old slide, but in the region we reach uh, nearly 35,000 people affected from the earthquake. 
and we also calculate or analyze the uh, effect of our psychosocial program. So by this analyze, we use in-depth individual interviews. There are some common themes uh, with the result of this analysis. This is employer satisfaction, easy accessibility, regular claims, tracking of employers, connecting people in need with services, employer, sincerity, caring and supportive attitude, and increasing awareness of the employer by promoting the association. These are the most common themes uh, about the result of interviews, in-depth individual interviews. And we also observed reduction of PTSD symptoms, employee reliability, uh, making the applicant feel understood, increasing the skills of proper communication with children or families, correct orientation, strong bond established between employees and applicants. And we also did capacity building trainings. These are face-to-face -face or online trainings. And we also uh, managed a Congress, a traumatic stress Congress in the earthquake region as well. For the capacity building uh, activities, there are many people attend these online or face-to-face -face activities. And we deal with some different NGOs. Here, some of the examples of these capacity building activities. And also there are many training activities that we held for the region and for all Turkey as well. These are some of the themes of our training work. As I said, there are some different training and capacity building activities throughout the year. And also we work with social media for the affected people and for the rest of the Turkey. And we also have some other uh, training efforts for our staff. These are some examples of these trainings. These are mainly held on Saturdays, so we called them Saturday trainings. And this is the Congress which we held in uh, Hatay, Antakya. There are many uh, NGOs uh, support this Congress and participated. It's a great effort. So this is the only and first Congress that has in the earthquake region as well. These are some photographs from the Congress, more than 300 people and the 25 non-governmental organization and professional organization participated to this Congress. And these are some other photographs from the Congress. And we also made a photograph exhibition during this Congress, which we uh, have from the earthquake region. These are some photographs from this exhibition. Also some other examples. And we run uh, for the earthquake, uh, the survivors of earthquake children to support their uh, education and to support their uh, educational materials. These are the bags for everyone. Uh, these are happy bags uh, and containing books, stationery, toys, and children. So the people, this is a charity running for uh, these children. So we support by this chair training to these children as well. And our uh, color is blue. So uh, we give the blue to the places we visit throughout the uh, earthquake region. Okay, thank you very much for your invitation and for giving me such an opportunity. Uh, for giving this this 
overview of a range, an enormous range of activities that you have um, presented to us. It's impressive to see how many people you've been able to connect in the aftermath of, of, of the earthquake and the range of activities uh, that, that's very widespread um, that you have organized from an educational, from a participant's perspective. Just, just if I may start with the first question and see if there's others that may join join in, is what what um, what do you perceive as the thing that is most difficult for um, for these survivors of earthquakes to um, to to deal with? Can you can you sort of help us list with the things that they feel that are most um, most most a, a sort of a priority that that would they would like to see met? Of course, there are many difficulties for the earthquake survivors because it's a big earthquake and they lost their loved ones, they lost their loved steeds, they lost their loved memories, they lost their colleagues, neighborhoods. Uh, so this is a very devastating one. So they need their, uh, their basic needs as well. So uh, in the first days, as you can uh, imagine that we support, we try to support their basic needs. But from the pandemic that we know that they, including their basic needs, we additionally try to reach them uh, with outreach programs or by using internet efforts. So uh, also uh, the region consists of some uh, refugee population. So we also work with refugee population as well, and we also work with uh, host population. And uh, there are some uh, stigmatization uh, issues with this host population and refugee population. Mm -hmm. And the difficult part uh, is working with children, working with women, disabled population. There are many traumatic stress reactions, traumatic grief reactions from the psychiatric point of view. So we established their uh, contact with the hospitals or psychiatric services or psychiatric polyclinics. We try to reach uh, the people uh, much by the outreach programs, and we try to work in a network uh, fashion. Uh, we establish great contacts with some other NGOs mm -hmm. and also with governmental organizations. Can you can you maybe that's 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 wonderful because. I feel that there's such a connect with the people in Ukraine. They're also seeing quite many losses because of the war. And there is also a great extent of grief. Yes, how you specifically were able to target traumatic grief in the aftermath of the earthquake. Our first uh, issue is making a triage, psychological first aid, psychoeducation, and brief counseling, if these are these steps are not sufficient for the grief survivors, we deal with some psychotherapeutic issues, mainly cognitive behavioral psychiatries, psychotherapies, and some of our colleagues use EMDR or such kind of eclectic techniques. But uh, I believe that my personal uh, working area is cognitive behavioral psychotherapies. Uh, CBT works well with these grief survivors, but uh, it will be very difficult. Mm -hmm. And getting more difficult, I think, mm -hmm. even we pass the year. So mm -hmm. as you may assume, the problems will go on five, 10 or 15 years and more. Thank you, Irina, you, you have a question. That's right. I have a lot of questions. Uh, it really echoes the situation uh, in terms of the situation and in terms of the experience. And my question is, as you said, that, there, that you had teams of different size in different locations. How do you plan for that? How do you define the number of staff members that you're sending? Does it mean that the amount of damage that certain place has suffered or are there other factors determining the size of the staff i also saw that your first webinars were held like one week after the earthquake so you've already 
organized events one week later what experience did you draw on some experience you had already had that you managed to respond so rapidly and so effectively to that disaster so this time and question three and difficult maybe how do you work with polarization with polarized communities because mm -hmm. you mentioned the refugees I was wondering if there are any interventions targeting this specific issue. Okay, in the first one is we plan uh, to implement the psychosocial support programs mainly according to the impact of the earthquake on the survivors and on the people. Uh, the second uh, question, as I can summarize, uh, Neil, I'm working uh, more than 30 years uh, with trauma and disaster areas. First, uh, my first working areas are torture survivors, then uh, internal displaced people. Then, as you may remember, we worked with uh, Marmara earthquake, 1999 earthquake in Turkey. And uh, I also work in uh, the tsunami effort in the South Asia especially Bandache, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka, and Pakistan in earthquake. And there are some different earthquakes and disasters in Turkey, so we worked uh, in there. And we were in Gaza, uh, Israel, Palestine, Bosnia, uh, and we worked with collaboratively with our uh, colleagues with there. And we also have some uh, in, uh, work with uh, Palestinian and Israeli colleagues together uh, in the past. And we work also some different uh, earthquakes. And at last, uh, we work uh, on pandemia. And before pandemia, uh, my team worked with uh, refugee mental health programs in Turkey. And this is related to your last question. Uh, there is a polarization issue uh, while they are working with refugee population before the pandemic. So we have an experience about working with polarization and we have an experience to implement psychosocial support programs. And we have an experience to implement the capacity building efforts and training programs. And also, uh, we are running this master program more than 20 years in Turkey. This is the first and only master program in Turkey. So the program has a PhD program. Uh, and this is one of the first one in Turkey. And this is the only one in Turkey. So I think uh, we are ready for the psychosocial support program, for the training efforts, for the capacity building efforts. But even we are ready, this is a huge earthquake, uh, including nearly uh, eight different uh, cities. So uh, it was very hard for us. Yeah, it's huge. And t typically, when, when I review the literature on, on, on the aftermath from a mental health perspective, there is such a high prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Um, do you anticipate that that is going to be any different in this one? No, I think so. There will be a, a huge prevalence of PTSD and the other uh, psychiatric problems in uh, psychiatric problems in earthquake region, plus uh, some other medical problems as well. Yeah. Uh, so we can wait more problems about psychiatry and plus the other medical conditions. This is a really huge disaster. It will affect yeah. the all health, including uh, the climate, including the natural health as well. Let's open to the audience who's with us, who um, may um, invite uh, a question. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to invite? There is one, I think, Irina, in the chat, or that's for me difficult to read. Uh, no, there are no questions in the chat so far. 
but I was thinking maybe Kurt would like to comment on the intervention. Please. Prosimo. So I think it was um, fascinating to me to see how you implemented this across so many locations. Um, you know, interestingly, I, I, I do have a question. How much of that did your organization have pre-stage prepared in advance, or did you assemble it very quickly and get it out into the locations, um, you know, almost as you were figuring mm -hmm. it out? Mm -hmm. In our association, we have academicians and some youngsters, but uh, our association's more uh, main thing is we have many activists, disaster activists. So uh, in the first day, uh, we were in we were in the region. So these activists, uh, being an activist, make some things more simpler and make the other things more difficult. So uh, as a disaster activist, but I and my friends can say that we also can work together with our Kurkainen colleagues and make, make some collaborative efforts with such kind of disasters, with such kind of dark issues about Mm -hmm. and against these dark issues. I, I can also observe that, you know, one of the things that commonly, at least from my experience within the United States, um, when disasters occur, there is always a wonderful and robust response for search and rescue and recovery and some of the immediate material needs. And a lot of times in disaster planning, the mental health part um, sometimes is left, is, is not as thoroughly thought out. Do you feel like that was the case in your experience here or, or was that not the case? It was the case, but uh, we are dealing mainly with psychosocial support and mental health. So we worked on mental health part as well. And I presume, since if, when I look at the um, the hot lines, I mean this is a hot spot for uh, earthquakes. The air, the whole area. I don't know what the name is of the area, but there's a name for the for the area, the region. Mm -hmm. So I presume that that already uh, includes preparatory activities for earthquakes. Next ones that will will be likely to come. Uh, of course, these capacity building efforts may serve the next earthquakes or the next yeah. effects of the earthquake is especially for the Istanbul earthquake uh, because many psychosocial support and mental health supports went from Istanbul and Marmara region to this earthquake region yeah. but in the future the situation may be different the mm -hmm. other regions uh, have to support us here in Istanbul so that's why capacity building efforts in all country and in the region is very important for us. By region, mm -hmm. I mean that the other countries, which are the neighborhoods of Turkey. Mm -hmm. Maybe a, a, a last question, if I may, before we then uh, um, move on to Kurt, Kurt West, is um, I have been involved in research in the um, Fukushima earthquake in Japan uh, that happened in 2011. And specifically what we were doing there in uh, helping the Japanese Ministry of Self-Defense is looking at the first responders. Okay, as I understood you correctly, first responders is very important for us. Uh, we established some uh, self-care and staff care programs. Uh, for this kind of first responders. This is not only the first aid people, or this is not only the healthcare workers. These include the teachers and some other professions. So we try to deal with such kind of programs, staff care and self-care programs. Uh, I think uh, 
may I can make a summarize that we have three steps: psychosocial support and mental health, capacity building efforts, and self care and staff care. So these mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. steps are very important for us. Okay. Well, sorry. Uh, sorry. The chat is very active. The chat ah. now is quite active and we have questions and comments and well you know what can we can we because i don't know just just exploring should we um entertain the questions now or populate them after the presentation of, of cold quest i think some of the questions can be a really good for the general discussion like which exercises are used to the restoration but two questions are quite specific i would ask fabian fabian the maker uh, the maker if you could please unmute and ask your question in English, we would appreciate this. And then Anton, your question also is okay. quite specific. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I joined you later, but I was wondering if you have particular programs uh, in place uh, to meet uh, the needs of uh, infants and also the caretakers in case of emergencies. Thank you. Where are you Where calling, are you in, calling from, in from, Fabian? From Belgium. Thank you. Thank you. For the children and for caregivers. Uh, I'm not a, a child psychiatrist or a child psychologist, but uh, in our team we have child psychiatrists, child uh, psychologists, mm -hmm. and psychological counselors. So we also plan. Uh, we also have some plans dealing with uh, children and their caregivers. These plans include the same things. I think the uh, games, uh, pictures and uh, psychoeducation with the caregivers, psychoeducation with the parents, psychosocial support programs uh, to the children and their caregivers. And we have some interventions with the uh, grief survivors, grief children, survivors of who are children. Uh, and this is a, such a broad range as well. So they are planning and dealing with the child section of our association. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for asking the question, Fabian. First of all, thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, this experience indeed is, uh, is useful. My question is, people who are under the rubbles in the earthquake, their condition, their state, and the recovery from that state, how comparable it is to uh, the condition and the state of people in Ukraine who also might be under the rubbles, but due to a different reason. If you could mm, compare. Thank mm. you. Of course, one is war and the other one is natural disaster. So these teams uh, have a difference. Uh, war is from human made and natural disasters are natural but in reality uh, this is not different uh, war is human made and natural disaster is human made also so we work with war survivors here uh, with syrian refugees and we also work with war survivors with bosnian uh, survivors in the bosnia war so working with war is another difficult issue. So uh, we have maybe using the same uh, CBT principles in the psychotherapy, but we also deal with other some social and political issues about this kind of war. It's, uh, it seems like Bosnian war, it seems like uh, Syrian war. Uh, so this may have some other challenge that the people uh, uh, know each other, that the people are neighborhoods. So these are important challenges for them. But 
the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy works with war and natural disaster survivors as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Th Antoine, where were you calling in from? I'm from Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Okay, thank you, Antoine. And th thank you, thank you, Professor Acker. Thank you, Tamer, for you. Uh, for what you're doing for us tonight at the late hour and for your uh, excellence and your wisdom. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, everybody can see that. Um, thanks for that introduction and, and thanks for inviting me to speak the, uh, today. As, as, as Eric mentioned, I'm Kurt West, uh, and I'm an associate professor of psychiatry at the Uniform Services University. What I'm going to talk about today is more of a conceptual discussion about how to plan, organize, and implement interventions that will sustain resilience in groups that are tasked with working in high-stress environments. And in this case, perhaps the highest stress environment that we can imagine, and that of going in and performing disaster relief in zones of high intensity conflict. I do need to tell you that I am an employee of the United States government, but everything that I'm presenting here are my own views. They don't reflect any official positions of the United States government or my institution. I don't have any conflicts of interest that I would declare relevant to this presentation. So just briefly, what I want to talk about is I'm going to give you a review of some of the principles of disaster psychiatry. Um, I'm going to link them to some of my own experience in combat and operational stress control. As Eric mentioned, um, I'm a Navy psychiatrist. A lot of my career was spent supporting the United States Marine Corps um, during uh, conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there's so much of what I did in that context that translates into the disaster realm. Um, and then from there, I wanna take that and kind of synthesize that into this concept of thinking about levels or tiers of intervention, um, and also a timeline of intervention um, across high stress operations. I do wanna take a little bit, just a moment to talk about where I'm from. Um, so I'm part of the Uniform Services University. This is the medical school of the United States military um, here in Bethesda, Maryland. And I'm part of the Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress. We've been around for over 35 years, um, working in just about every major disaster in the United States uh, and many international events as well. A very important part of our work centers on education and training about psychological and behavior effects of disasters, but also interventions that help enhance well-being and restore functioning for individuals and communities after disaster or other high stress events. Uh oh, something just. <laughs> Moving forward. No, something just happened. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Okay. okay. I don't. I don't know what just happened, but I'm. I'm okay. Uh, so why this topic today? If it doesn't take uh, too much to imagine that there are natural disasters that continue to occur, but right now we are in an era of unprecedented uh, high intensity conflict that's occurring in multiple regions around the globe, and I, I don't need to explain that to this audience. Um, but now we are asking these humanitarian workers to step into areas where the threat is more than just the natural event that occurred. Um, and I, I think uh, Dr. Acker's you know, example of the earthquake in Turkey, uh, it was the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And, and um, you know, we, we have to acknowledge that, um, you know, the white helmets that are, you know, if, if you've followed um, any of what's gone on in Syria in the last 10 years, they have uh, this incredible humanitarian effort called the White Helmets, which are disaster rescue workers. Um, and they found themselves, you know, now uh, 
that much of their work has been done in armed conflict, but now there's a, an earthquake to respond to as well. So these intersections are becoming uh, more significant and more common. Let me take a moment to just introduce you to some of the fundamentals of, of the world I work in, which is disaster psychiatry. After um, the core of disaster and preventive psychiatry is thinking about these reactions of individuals and communities to extreme events. So after major storms, wildfires, mass shootings, infectious outbreaks, there's this collection of consistently observable reactions that occur in individuals and communities. We tend to think about disorders, things like PTSD, depression, anxiety disorders. But the reality is, with much greater prevalence, the public has and experiences distress reactions and they engage in health risk behaviors in response to these extreme stress events. Things like insomnia, reduced sense of safety, substance use, family conflict. These are common distress reactions that occur after extreme events. They also can lead to, in an effort to cope, health risk behaviors. The greatest example of this would be alcohol use. Transient increased use of alcohol as a, as a health risk behavior after disaster, it's associated with work errors, accidents, presenteeism in the workplace. It also contributes to family conflict, but it may be driven by a decreased sense of safety. And so what I want to illustrate by pointing that out is that the approach to intervening for that alcohol use may be very different in the context of responding to a disaster. The other thing I want to point out, and you should all be familiar with this, is that the vast majority of people in high stress events will ultimately do well, many of them without much specific intervention. They will be resilient. I'm a psychiatrist, uh, but most people in mental health tend to focus on the diagnosis and treatment of illness. In disaster and preventive psychiatry, we also look at this public health model that looks at this experience along a continuum, a continuum of expectable responses, many of which are not pathologic. So we are not necessarily trying to diagnose and treat illnesses, but we're helping individuals in the communities they're a part of identify these reactions, think about where do they fall in this continuum, and then promote actions that help them move back towards a state of wellness, but also an ability to contribute to recovery from the crisis. As Eric mentioned, my background is in combat and operational stress control. So militaries have been doing this for centuries, um, but certainly in the last century have devoted a lot of thought to a framework for understanding how individuals and groups respond in these extreme environments, but and also how to support them. So COSC has its origins in World War I, um, where psychiatrists were called on probably for the first time to support troops that were experiencing violence and death on a scale that had never really been seen before. Um, and many developed these unusual psychophysiologic reactions, which you'll recall as the term shell shock. And it was in this environment that the earliest principles, these PIES principles, I'll talk about those in a moment, that were developed. Subsequently, we learned that putting mental health resources closer to battle lines was useful and enabled soldiers to sustain their ability to continue fighting the enemy. Take that all the way to the present day, and you can see a picture of me there, um, and that is we actually took it a step further and 
integrated mental health workers into the organizational structure of military units so that they could learn about the culture and, and provide culturally appropriate care and intervention for the groups that they were serving. COSC interventions are based on very simple principles. Um, the most concise acronym is this one we call PIES, proximity, immediacy, expectancy, and simplicity. What that means to say is that support for distressed individuals should happen as close to the fighting as it is safe and practical to do so. And we wanna do that so that soldiers sustain the attachment to their units. We want it to occur as quickly as possible. These should not linger around and, and wait and six months later start talking about the awful thing that happened. Um, it should also um, be conducted with this expectation or expectancy that they're gonna get better, which is, it's true for the vast majority of cases. Anybody who works with trauma recognizes that time is one of the greatest healing factors in trauma. Um, and then the last thing is keep it simple. I mean, this is not, war zones are not the place to be doing deep psychodynamic exploration. It's really simple interventions, focusing on basic material needs, finding a sense of safety, restore or correcting, uh, you know, defective or correcting difficult cognitions that are contributing to distress, but very simple stuff. Um, and in that vein, you know, we use these principles of psychological first aid. We want people to identify a sense of safety. We need to get them down from an elevated sense of physiologic arousal. And then we want them to start focusing on what they can do and what the people around them can do to start taking control of the situation. We want them to be recognized that they are connected to others, that they are not unique in their suffering, but they are also not alone in their suffering. And then finally, we want them to recognize that things will get better and embrace that idea. So these principles, as I start talking more about how the structure, um, the, the interventions around this, um, these principles you'll, you'll see are kind of woven through this. So how does that then translate into uh, this conceptual framework that I was talking about? Well, the first concept has to do with who provides intervention. And this is what I refer to as tiers of support. And you'll notice I present this as a pyramid. And what that represents is both the acuity of the people that are being helped, but also to give you a relative idea of the numbers, right? Um, so really the base of the period of pyramid and the largest population would benefit from self-help interventions. These are the simplest interventions. Dr. Acker referred to you know, things like relaxation, calming, grounding, um, cognitive reframing. I heard that mentioned multiple times. It also includes things like uh, reinforcing proper self-care in terms of sleep, nutrition, uh, fitness. Peer support takes many forms. What it is at its core is about finding ways to get members of a group to engage in and leverage this connectedness principle of psychological first aid. We want them to engage in healthy peer support as opposed to unhealthy peer support, which I refer to as sort of like othering and uniting against uh, other groups that are fighting for resources. We want to avoid that, but we want that healthy peer support of recognizing, yes, we're all having a difficult time. Yes, we are in this together. Yes, I understand what you're going through and it will get better. Um, in some, in some like large organizations, you may even see this as uh, peer support programs where they'll identify individuals, give them special training, place them out into the workforce or into the community and say, here's a peer support specialist. Um, and they are identified resources that people can just go to and start talking. Um, again, this is 
these are all below the level of clinical care that so many of us are used to thinking about. Another area that's very important, another important tier are the actions, policies, the practices of organizations and communities. Um, and within that falls leadership. Um, but organizations need to have policies that support resilience in the face of extreme stress. Things like rest plans, um, ensuring proper protective equipment and people understand how to use proper protective equipment. Um, some of the examples I'll give are relevant to COVID and healthcare organizations, um, but also having leadership that informs and inspires the group um, is also essential. And then you'll notice way up at the top in the smallest part of the pyramid is this part that needs screening and referral to clinical care, right? So inevitably there are going to be people that in spite of adequate peer support, or maybe they miss peer support, or maybe self-help was not effective, or maybe whatever happened to them, whatever they're experiencing is so great and so overwhelming that they are only going to benefit from professional help. And, and absolutely, there should be systems in place to identify those individual and get them referred to the appropriate care. One of the things that was very much a part of my life in military psychiatry was recognizing this idea of a life cycle of psychological support. And that is thinking about phases of preparation, sustainment when you're in the operation, but then also thinking about healthy reintegration following uh, operations. And I'll just briefly touch on those. Um, you know, the key steps of preparation involve education and really material support to the extent possible. And disasters don't always work this way. They sometimes come on suddenly and there's not a lot of time to prepare people um, or there's limited time and you can only provide so much education and information. But to the extent possible, disaster workers benefit when they are educated on the types of environmental and psychological exposures they can anticipate. This is what you're going to see. These are the threats that you may encounter. Here are the countermeasures that we are giving you or we are equipping you with to protect you against that. And here's how they work and here's how you can benefit. It's also useful to help educate people on what are some expectable responses. What might it be like if this is your first time or if this is an environment that you haven't been to before, what might you expect to encounter in terms of your own reactions, thoughts, feelings? In sustainment during operations, it's important to monitor and to the extent possible control the amount of exposure people get. Um, if a recovery operation can be done safely with five people, there is very little point to exposing 30 people to the death and violence that they would witness um, and, unless they need to be there. So in other words, limit the amount of exposure, but also keep track of how much people are getting. We tend to focus on symptoms. I would encourage a different approach. Think about what people have seen, how much people have seen, and, and then come back and ask about symptoms. Because um, one of the things we've learned in military psychiatry is people don't always understand symptoms or people may try to hide symptoms because they want to be okay and they don't want your help. But if they, if you, but they'll more freely talk about what they've, what, you know, how much they've done or how much they've seen. And that can give people, give you a sense of how much risk they may be at. The last thing I want to highlight is, um, this idea of reintegration. And this is something that's been heavy on my mind in the last few years, especially as COVID started to wind down. Um, and this reintegration is perhaps the most important phase. And that's the idea of preparing people to return to life as usual when there's no longer a crisis. Um, I think we underestimate how significant that adapt adaptation can be. So, people who are in disaster response are part of something that's very important. It's 
often very high intensity um, and it's very rewarding. And then they come back to everyday life. Um, and it's hard to feel like everyday life has the same kind of meaning. Um, and a lot of things in everyday life are frankly just irritating. So it's important to prepare people to be going back to that. And I just want to, as I finish up, just to share some examples of, of how this worked here, here in the United States and some of the organizations that we worked at at CSTS um, related to healthcare work and, and the response to the COVID pandemic. Everybody's experience with COVID was kind of the same when it came to preparation. There was very little time, particularly psychologically. I think we all, um, well, we saw it coming, but there was very little time to prepare uh, for the extreme demands that were placed on healthcare workers, especially during that early phase of the pandemic. Many people got re reassigned from their regular work to this high stress, high work, high risk work with severely ill patients with an infection that was very threatening to them as well. Um, and so at that time, it was hard to identify reliable information. It was even harder to find that sense of safety in the beginning. But very quickly, organizations did start taking steps to mitigate the distress. One uh, excellent example that we um, worked with the University of Minnesota, their healthcare system implemented a structured peer support program or battle buddy program where workers paired up and they were just encouraged to check in regularly with each other, uh, whether they needed it or not and just talk about how they were doing and how things were going. What, what did they deal with that day? What was, what was going on? Again, the idea of having at least one person who understood what was going on with you. Um, in, in New York City, we watched as multiple healthcare systems recognized this uh, combat stress control model of embedding mental health providers in with these healthcare teams so that there was a person who was seen in the hospital areas and says, oh, she gets what I'm going through and she uh, is a part of my community. If I need help, I can go talk to her. Even if I just want to check in, I can do that. And so the idea of embedding uh, mental health instead of waiting for people to come forward um, was a big improvement. And finally, many organizations in the recovery and reintegration recognized that the long amount of time that we took treating COVID patients, it was going to come with a considerable psychological need, especially as things slowed down and people had the time to process what they'd been through. Um, New York City Health and Hospitals, who we also worked with, created this um, train the trainer program called Hero New York that was designed to help providers recognize among other things, recognize and adapt to these challenges associated with um, reintegration. So I realized that this was kind of a treat, a very quick um, overview of a very dense conceptual framework. Um, I hope it's helpful. I hope you're looking at this um, in your own work environment or in your own community and thinking about, oh, wait, I'm, I don't see that there is a peer support mechanism or, or that, that I can understand that that's working well in my community. Um, so it's really, I hope, a conceptual framework that you can apply in whatever work you're doing at whatever level. And with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Kurt. That was a, a, a brilliant overview of, of principles that are at the heart of the matter, I think um, that's how I look at it. Um, may maybe if I may, the, the first question that comes to mind and um, my, my connection um, uh, failed for like three or four minutes. So I, I logged in from another device. But no, the thing that I have been discussing with Irina and with others in, in Ukraine is there's been a war now for almost two years actually much longer so when you when you look at the principles of psychological first aid how can you translate these first aid principles to sustained aid how what what would drive the 
sustainability of these factors that you nicely identified as first aid principles to principles that could sustain aid. Um, if you understand my where, where I'm coming from, um, what, what are sustainability factors that you could identify? Sure, I think um, one of the key principles within psychological first aid that definitely um, applies to sustained aid um, would be this idea of self and collective efficacy is the sense of identifying areas of control and influence within this distressing situation, reinforcing um, the, those help, reinforcing those areas where people are able to exercise control and influence. I was wondering if my colleagues would like to comment on that, but before that, I'd like to make several important points. I am grateful to the bottom of my heart. Uh, thank you, Kurt, and your colleagues for Joshua Morgenstein and Bob Rosanna. I could go on. I think I know pretty much everyone we've been working with, your colleagues, <laughs> yes, because they do. were speakers to our hot topics. Um, yes, I just added another name because we've translated the resources from your center into Ukrainian. We didn't have time, as you said. So we took a couple of pages, summaries, and here Kurt put, put the link to the website, and I'm going to put the link to the translated yeah. resources. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. try to spread the information among our colleagues, volunteers, non-professional psychologists. Uh, we wanted to share different stress intervention, the do's and do nots, how you help the kids, how you help the servicemen. It was most helpful. So um, it's heartwarming thinking back to that support. And it was great to have those resources at hand. That was my first point. So can Second. I take just a, could I take just a minute to highlight right, the resources that you're describing? We've spent decades refining this method, but what we offer, and that's why I put our website up, is we offer one to two page fact sheets. And yeah. the reason we do that is they are meant to be very quick and actionable pieces of information to a specific circumstance that you may find yourself in. Um, and they're written at a level, you don't have to be a clinically trained psychologist to understand what we're talking about. And you can provide these to patients, to families, to community leaders that you think would benefit from having this perspective. Um, that that's, that's why we design them because when people are under extreme stress, they can't process a lot of information and they need it now and they need just a little bit. That's right. Yes. Yes, yes, it's true. It's true indeed. Uh, we were inspired by it. Uh, I'm posting, putting the link in the Ukrainian language resources in the chat. I could go on and on, but I would like to touch upon the moral injury issue. So maybe this lack of capacity of timely providing assistance creates this feeling of injustice that people sacrifice their health uh, through their service. Uh, they save people, uh, the combat medics, the servicemen, and in return, uh, they do not get the assistance they deserve. I was wondering, Kurt, how did you go about that? I know that you worked with hmm. the infantry servicemen, and I know this is probably the hard, the hardest population, so to say, to work with. Well, I have, I think I have a very privileged perspective in that, you know, in my country, there were enormous resources that were directed um, and and fairly quickly um, to 
support the armed services. Um, and so the, the moral injury of not having enough, I don't think really was a, an issue from my military experience. From the COVID experience, that was a core component of what people struggled with. Um, not having enough equipment to safely care for the patients that were dying in front of them and being helpless to do anything about it. Um, you know, there is, um, I, but I also think about that there is the stuff you do immediately and there is the stuff that you then deal with long term. Um, you know, the military uh, would say, you take stuff like that and you stuff it in your pack um, and you'll deal with it later. Medical people do that. Uh, disaster responders do that. Uh, by being in, engaged with them when they're in the work, you hopefully can diffuse some of that, um, but you recognize that there's gonna be a fair amount of unpacking to do later on. And in the case of Ukraine, when is later on going to come? Um, yeah. That that's yeah. Uh, that I believe is an existential question I don't have an answer to right now. Yeah, Kurt, if I may, Irina, like w w whenever we do these webinars and we always hear presenters talk about interventions that were developed uh, after the war was over. And here we are trying to uh, provide interventions, ideas, uh, opportunities in a country that is in an ongoing war. So that's also was my question. And if we can learn new principles for sustained uh, resilience, if I may may call it that, um, uh, in 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 reference to the first first aid. So so that that's a challenge. I think also Irina expressed that, and the others on the line also. We're still at war. So how can we? How can we uh, learn and um, what can we take? And again, I, you know, the other, the other, it's those last three principles of psychological first aid that will sustain us. Um, mm -hmm. The idea that, that we are not alone, that we can do this together. Um, and that eventually there is a better, mm -hmm. there is a better, there is a better day. Um, and holding on to that now is is that psychological intervention or is that spiritual intervention? I think we're starting to get into the gray area a little bit. Yeah. Well, Irina, I cannot see the chat mm -hmm. or so since I'm on my mobile phone, but you can see and I cannot see multiple screens on my mobile mm -hmm. phone. But can you can you see if there's questions from the audience? First of all. Uh, there are huge thanks for this well-structured and practical presentations. Very useful, brief, informative. So, well, this is really... Well, it takes a talent to present important things in this brief and effective uh, form. There are some questions remaining from the previous discussion. And the question is, uh, can you please share which exercises, for example, do you use to uh, help people recover? And do you have some uh, practical, applicable guidelines? Uh, have you developed any methodologies for these trainings? So maybe mm. something on peer support or mm. uh, something. They want the methodology. I, I personally am a, a, a big fan of mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness interventions, for those who aren't familiar with it, that's the idea of um, being able to to keep yourself sort of grounded in a very present-centered orientation um, and not allowing yourself to get too caught up in the meanings of, of thoughts and feelings, but allowing them to come and pass and observe them and move on. Um, I will say that there are various um, applications that people can put on their smartphones. I don't know to what extent um, our audience uses those, um, but different applications that take people into just even brief exercises. We use one that's um, called Mindfulness Coach. 
Um, it was mm -hmm. developed by the National Center for PTSD. It has wonderful, just brief exercises. They take five to 15 minutes, depending on how in depth you go with the, the different exercises. Uh, a great resource, Mindfulness Coach. Thank you, Kurt. Um, Tamar, any any uh, additional suggestions that you would give to the um, to the question? I think some uh, somatic experiences work well, additional to mindfulness, uh, and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Irina, can you address some others that are still there or are there others that are still there that want to ask a question? Okay, okay. Well, if if so, then um, I, th I think what, what, what I learned from this is, is these um, sustaining in the doing what we learned from you um, and keep doing it. And uh, what, I, what I feel every time we do these webinars that we need to provide that uh, support to one another to keep doing what we're doing with Irina. And it's wonderful to have these um, guiding principles that you now, Tamar, tonight and Kurt tonight provide to us. The co Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and we, if we open the cameras before you close, then we can see that there's all live people behind all these screens. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> all right. Beautiful. That's always a very cher cherishable moment. Wishing you all the best. Stay healthy. All right. Thank you, Irina. Thank Tamar. Thank Thanks, you. Kurt. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye bye now.